Hello and welcome back to Have Your Say, one-on-one -on -one shadow boxing from WTV Studios. And our guest is still David. Talk about, you know, the difference or the, between the two sort of camp of scientists. One is the climate change scientist, and another is scientists who are working on the sun and sun cycles. Well, they don't talk to each other. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's a division, not a difference. <laughs> Um, I started out in climate science in 2006. I was asked to replicate the work of a German scientist on the role of the planets in controlling the solar cycle and thus climate and weather and all that. Who was that gentleman? A uh, German scientist by the name of Theodor Landschied. Yes. And I couldn't do his stuff, but I, it would lead me down another route, which said that solar cycles do control the climate, and I put together some papers. Um, and one thing was evident way back then, was that no one in the traditional climate side of the science yes. ever wanted to talk to anybody on the solar side. Why is that? Well, they might have to change their mind. They might have to say that actually, well, everything's controlled by the sun and there's no point in doing anything otherwise. You know, it's all over. Mm. So, the other camp? The solar, uh, the solar scientists, they've been in a bit of a shock because things didn't turn out as they expected. If you go back a, bit, a decade ago, there were about 72 yes. predictions of the amplitude of solar cycle 24, which is just over. It ended, started in December 2008. It probably ended about um, 2020. And right at the moment, there's only two or three because no one got it right and they think there's too much risk to their reputation to make a prediction. So no one's making a prediction. They'd rather not. Um, so there's not much help from the solar people, actually. On, um, on climate. On the future of climate. Yeah, yeah. But the history is, exists. So we know what was, what's happened in the past, as mm. we a little bit touched upon that one in the first half mm. of this program. And uh, we know what is the present. We're yes. aware that there was a medieval warm period, about 1000 AD, where Western Europe had 300 very good years of, of, uh, of very warm weather. And sea level was about a metre higher than it is at the moment. Then we went into the Little Ice Age, things cooled down, and... Um, but the second half of the 20th century, the sun was more active than it had been in the previous 8,000 years. Now, I'd expect that if 100% of energy that sustains life on this planet comes from the sun, there yes. will be an effect on climate. And so there was. We had this gentle, mild warming, which was very pleasant. In fact, there was a CIRA report done in 1973 saying the world's had the best agricultural growing conditions for the last 800 years. So David, if this is what's happening, okay, we're cooling down slowly, mm. of course it's not happening one day mm. to the other, as the, the warming up is not happening mm. quickly, uh, how do we uh, see the different sort of climates of the different uh, parts of Earth are all going to the mind but shrinking or uh, growing or, so always we got very cold parts Mm -hmm. On Earth, we got sort of warms mm -hmm. on Earth around the equator now. But is that changing or how does it will work out? So if the people want to migrate with the change, mm. can they do that? Well, we could all go to Queensland. Um, <laughs> to answer your question, there are things called the Hadley cells and those Hadley cells will shrink towards the equator a little bit. And for Western Australia, for instance, yes. we'll probably get the climate of Bunbury which for most people wouldn't be able to tell the difference. No, um, it could be even enjoyable, I think. Yes. Um, even if it's a little bit of snow, we can do. You can dream. <laughs> if we can dream, <laughs> yes, about snow. <laughs> but we'll basically get the climate of the place that's 300 kilometres south of us, yes. which means that we'll get the westerlies that pass the south of Australia will currently sort of impinge upon here and at, uh, South Australia, Victoria. Yes. So with climate change and with the solar uh, systems and, and the sun's influence on climate change and gripping it all through history, uh, why don't the climate scientists not going back to real science, the history of the rocks in the mm -hmm. Earth's history, they should have you know, quite good evidence to that without man's present or human present present in, in the mm. history. This change has always happened. Change has always happened. Uh, we could have a volcano next week. I mean, so the things are very gradual, but 
Interestingly, sort of... that's what my wife said this morning. What's happened in the time when we got all these volcanoes working and, you know, you not even got a clear sky? Okay, the last big one was Pinatubo in 1991 and the world cooled by 0.7 degrees centigrade. Because of that action? Yes, yes. In one volcano's action? Yes, one volcano action. That was the height of a very warm period. If we get it overprinted on a colder period, things could get a lot colder faster. Yes. So in, to answer your question, generally things are so gradual it will be glacial um, compared to our own human existence. But a volcano could come over long and, and overprint things. And that's towards the cooling down, not oh, the yes, warming yeah. up. We could suddenly have a 20 or 30% reduction in world grain production, which will be a big thing. For the, for the humankind. So, mm. how can we, well, what can we, you know, to do to to get the right food and the the lessons from the Bible? Yes. Um, the seven years of fat followed by the seven years of lean. Joseph interpreting the emperor's dream. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very true. Yes. Uh, to take an instance of Norway. Norway's had va bad wheat crops for the last ten years now, as a, as a North Atlantic started cooling. Yes. They had a bad experience in the Second World War, so the Norwegian government said, we will, we will now store one year's worth of grain in the country permanently. Now, come 1996, which is about 40 years after the war, they said, we've, we're not going to have any problems anymore. We'll convert all those grain storage silos into student accommodation instead. You just see it is. Yeah, so <laughs> it just takes two generations to forget lessons. Um, <laughs> And so then we, we suffer again, and people have to suffer again to find out how the world works, actually. So we have to use our common sense mm. rather than anything mm. else. Mm. David, you got a sort of quiet, spectacular sort of life because you've been invited by good and big organizations, and you got a sort of capability to lecture, you know, even in the Senate of the United States mm -hmm. in both houses. So tell us about something of your international experience and why and how do you get there? It's a lesson I had from stockbroking from 30 years ago when I was an analyst. And one day the uh, head of research got the analyst into a meeting and he said, hands up those here to make money. And I was one of those who put my hand up. I guess I'm here to make money, lots of money. Then he said, hands up those who want to be the best in their field. And some other people put their hands up. Yes. And he said, the ones who want to be the best in their field will make money. Those who want to make money won't make any money at all. And that's true of life. So yes. if you want to be successful, my, my advice is to be the best in your field, to make a difference, and then things happen. So in 2008, I got uh, an email from David Bellamy, a famous prof professor from the UK, who said he wanted to come to see me in Perth. So I emailed him back and said, I'd like to show you off to my friends. We'll have a dinner party. And we did. Yes. And uh, that was fabulous. And he told me to write my first book, and I wrote my first book. I sent a copy of that book to Vastav Klaus, the president of the Czech Republic. And... Uh, Why him? Because he was the only world leader who saw through the nonsense of global warming. He wrote a book about it called Blue, Blue Planet in Green Shackles. <laughs> I like the title. Uh, and um, so I invited myself to go to see Vastav Klaus and I spent an hour with him in Hadrani Castle. And he told me to write my next book. In fact, we were having a, a meeting like this and he walked over to his bookshelves and he knew where my book was on his bookshelves. I thought, this is the president of a republic of 8 million people and he knows stuff about me. Yeah. Um, so I thought, well, this is about being in the Knights Templar. I'm meeting my um, spiritual leader in his medieval castle and he gave me a mission. So I wrote my second book. And uh, then I got invited to Washington to lecture in a U.S. Senate hearing room. And I was there, when I was there, I gave a lecture to a place called the Institute of World Politics on climate. Yeah. And they're a graduate school for the CIA, State Department, Department of Defence. Yeah. Most of their students are uh, spooks in the whole U.S. security industry. And they invited me to give another lecture when I was coming through Washington again. Climate is essentially a very long, boring subject long term. Can be, uh, yes. Uh, and most of the stuff has been figured out now, actually. We're just waiting for things to happen. And they, uh, I made up for them, because that was the time of the Arab Spring, and when I read that Egypt imports half its food, I thought that can only end in tears. So I made up for them a lecture entitled The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which is now 200 slides, takes two hours to give, 
Um, and that in turn became a book entitled um, Twilight of Abundance, which dealt with a number of problems around the world, including Chinese aggression in East Asia and uh, the Pakistani nuclear bomb program. And then more recently, one of those themes, the Chinese aggression, I got turned into a book called um, Australia's Defence, because they're very concerned about our lack of defence. On that note, David, we finished today, but I would like to have you back on Defence, Australia Defence, next time. Looking forward to Thank you. And don't forget, next week, same channel, same time. Have your say, one-on-one -on -one shadow boxing. <laughs>